if it allows me to move along. Okay, we've done this slide about what the goals of the session are. Um, the next thing is, who is this talk for? And the audience is home HF station owners who are building a new station, which is exactly the time to do grounding and bonding because you don't have to disassemble a station to do it. Maybe you're upgrading a small station, which is starts out, everybody starts out as some boxes on a table or a desk, and then things get bigger and bigger. And uh, you're thinking, well, maybe this would be a good time to do uh, some of this grounding and bonding stuff I keep hearing about. Yes, that's a very good time. Maybe you're adding an amplifier. You'll meet the neighbors and you'll find all the weak spots in your grounding and bonding in your station. So uh, you'll need some techniques to deal with that stronger uh, signal. And you guys live in lightning country. Uh, I do too here in Missouri. So uh, grounding and bonding is very important if you're worried about lightning at all. Maybe you're just trying for better performance for your station and trying to squeeze a dB or two out of it. And uh, you'd be surprised at how attention to grounding and bonding, particularly bonding, can help. Okay. There we go. If you're a mobile HF station owner uh, and you're installing a new station, you've got to worry about power wiring, uh, which is uh, much different in a mobile. You've got equipment bonding uh, to worry about. Is because um, you're right in the antenna in a mobile station. So bonding uh, can be a very important topic. Plus, you've got antenna and feed line issues. This is all something uh, definitely more intense than in a home HF station. Plus, you're dealing with RFI and noise. We've got some ham radio references for you. Uh, the ARL handbook and the antenna book both have a lot of current information. As the editor, I've been able to make sure we're including a lot of this information in those books. And then there's the NEC handbook. Um, can you see my uh, camera at all on screen? Tom, can you see a cam? Can you see me personally or just no. the uh, PowerPoint? Uh, I can see you uh, not on your screen. I only see the PowerPoint, but I can see you on the list of participants on the right hand side. Okay, but you can't see video from me. Okay. All right, um, the NEC handbook, I was going to lift up this giant book, which is about two inches thick and show it to you. The NEC stands for the National Electrical Code. And it is actually a very small book because it's just a list of legal, uh, legally written requirements. And um, the handbook is a much larger book and it has uh, pictures and discussions and rationale and it shows you how to implement all these things. There's, it's a really intimidating looking book, but there's only two chapters called articles that really um, apply to the uh, amateur station. And that's article 200, which deals with grounding and then article 800, which deals with uh, communications antennas. And there's actually a section on amateur radio. The other thing you wanna do is get the lightning protection for the amateur station, which is a series of three articles that Ron Block in R2B wrote in 2002 for QST. These are available on the ARL website and they're not uh, members only, uh, so anyone can see them. Just uh, search for Ron Block or Lightning Protection in the uh, uh, search window. Very good articles um, on dealing with lightning protection in your station. Ron was one of the reviewers of my uh, book. K9YC, Yankee Charlie. Jim Brown has written a number of excellent tutorials, and the two that really apply here are power grounding, bonding, and audio for amateur radio, and RFI ferrites and common mode chokes for hams, which are available uh, at his website. Uh, it's worth uh, bookmarking that and taking a look at what he's got. WHAI lives on a mountaintop in Georgia with a 300-foot tower, so he knows a lot about lightning, and his uh, website, thegroundsystems.com.htm, uh, um, is very good. There's a lot of interesting information there. And for mobile stations, your go-to site is uh, Alan Applegate, K0BG's website at k0bg.com. And like I said, uh, the PDF slides are in Jeffrey's hands, so you don't have to worry about writing all this down. Okay, another background reference, and uh, you guys get to see the brand new cover of the brand new second edition here, um, Grounding and Bonding for the Radio Amateur. It covers 
AC wiring, lightning protection, and RF management. And it's um, reviewed by a number of experts, such as Ron Block, Jim Brown, K9YC, Dale Svetinoff, uh, WA9ENA. Dale and uh, Ron are both professional lightning consultants. And uh, the ARRL lab was involved. And uh, they really uh, are the people that created the deep expertise on these topics. I know a bunch of things, but these guys know uh, know it in depth, and they really added a lot of value to the book. There are numerous examples in the book to use, but like I said, want to reiterate, this is a uh, toolbox talk, not a cookbook talk. So let's jump right in. What is ground anyway? It has different meanings. It's a word that can be a noun, a verb, or an adjective. So um, it can be a describing a thing. A ground is an earth connection. And that's usually how you deal with it in AC safety and lightning. Um, it can be a local reference potential or voltage. And that's how you think of it in circuits like analog ground, digital ground, and RF as well. It could be a verb, which is an action. I'm going to ground something. I'm going to connect it to the reference potential. And it can be an adjective, such as a ground conductor or ground system. So be careful about how you use this word. We uh, tend to overuse it and rather imprecisely. So you can get all these things at the same time into a sentence like, I'm grounding the chassis to ground with the ground wire. Um, so you got to be careful uh, when you use that word. The earth is not. This is another uh, part of the definition. We think of ground as this big zero volt thing. It's not uh, that at all. It's not a magic sink into which you stick a ground rod and clip a wire onto it and suddenly RF and lightning and everything just magically disappear into the earth. It doesn't work that way. Um, the earth has impedance. The earth has size and um, it acts differently at different frequencies and the same for a vehicle body. There are also some very fuzzy definitions. Uh, we talk about RF ground. I try not to use that term because it implies things that just aren't true. Um, and I tell people there really ain't no such thing. You can only create a local reference potential over a range of uh, frequencies and wavelengths. Anything outside that range, your RF ground isn't going to act like an RF ground anymore. So try to not use that word. Uh, it just gives you false hope about what you're trying to do. Ground loops are another thing. Uh, if you go look behind your equipment, any conductive path that goes around um, some cables and a couple of pieces of equipment, um, that's a ground loop, and you're not going to get rid of them. The typical ham station is full of dozens of these things. Ground loop is a term that really comes out of the audio and AC safety um, environments, uh, deals with very low frequencies compared to RF, and um, uh, ground loops are to prevent neutral currents uh, that circulate within a power system and also uh, create an opportunity to pick up magnetic fields and for audio. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's not really possible to get rid of them all. Single point ground, the, the term single point depends on frequency. The implication is that it's electrically very small. So um, single point at 60 hertz, where the wavelength is 50 million meters, single point might be something the size of a football stadium. Whereas up in the ham RF range, single point can only be maybe a few inches or a couple of feet and still act like one voltage at RF. So you have to be careful about that. So each set of requirements uses the term ground differently. And if you think this is complicated, it is. Uh, we uh, badly overuse the word. You, my bringing up of these definitions and whatnot are to alert you to the fact that you have to be careful when you use the word. Next uh, is bonding. What is bonding? If you go look up the definition, bonding is simply a connection that's intended to keep two points at the same voltage. That's it. Um, it's not um, a particular type of connection. It doesn't mean um, certain types of materials or connectors or anything or welding. It's just a connection that keeps two points at the same voltage. And that's so important uh, because everything goes up and down together. Uh, it, when you have bonded stuff together and they're at the same voltage, even if a 
big current comes along or a big voltage pulse comes along, everything goes up and down together. And that prevents shock hazards from voltage differences between pieces of equipment. Uh, that's very important in the AC safety world. In the lightning world, um, bonding prevents destructive voltage differences that are caused by lightning surges and the big currents that change very rapidly and the voltage transients. Bonding things together keeps one piece of equipment from suddenly being hundreds or thousands of volts different than another piece of equipment and uh, damaging both. Bonding also limits current between devices. What causes current to flow? A voltage. Uh, voltage between point A and point B causes current flow between point A and point B. So if you don't want common mode current flow in your station, you want to bond your equipment together so that it minimizes voltage difference from, from RF pickup. Bonding sounds really hard, but it's not. Um, uh, certainly we can make anything as hard as we want, but typically it's not hard. It just, it, it, it simply involves connecting things together through a common a ground bus or a bonding bus, um, or simply connecting them directly together. It also sounds expensive, like you have to do some kind of special welding or clamps or connectors. It's really not. We all have most of the uh, materials that we need in our stations or whatever in our garage right now. So it's intimidating to think about, but once you get into it, you'll find, oh, that's easy. Well, it is but it does require that you use the right connecting materials and hardware, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Bonding, when you do it uh, consistently, it works in your favor for all three types of requirements, AC safety, lightning protection, and RF management. For bonding to work, looks like single point, it has to be short at the frequencies of interest. These connectors have to be less, much less than a 10th of a wavelength. Anything when you get beyond a 10th of a wavelength a connection begins to act like a transmission line and um, and that's not good. So you need a low impedance, short connection for bonding to work. The bonding connection also has to be heavy enough to carry the expected current. Bonding for lightning protection, for example, has to carry some very studly currents, kiloamps. It's a kind of a scary thing. Um, and so you need big wires and, and big cables and that's why the building codes specify number six, number four, whatever. It has to be sturdy enough to survive the environment, particularly if it's outside. Um, if it's buried there in Denver, you can have frost heat problems. Um, or if it's just in your yard, say you have a buried ground radial, it has to be heavy enough so that when you dig it up with the rototiller, don't ask how I know that. It has to be heavy enough for you to notice that you hit a ground conductor and not cut it. If it, you cut the conductor with a shovel or a piece of equipment or you drive over it and break it, um, you, you've lost your connection and you might not realize that. So the connectors, uh, the conductors have to be sturdy enough to survive where they are installed. Inside your station, use solid strap, 20 gauge strap. Um, it can be copper usually, but it can also be aluminum. Um, that's the commercial and military standard, 20 gauge strap or heavy wire. All that Romex cable that we save and save and save uh, because we might use it someday. Well, this is where you use it. Number 14 solid copper wire is a terrific bonding uh, conductor in the ham station. You can also use flat weave tin braid. That's the silver stuff um, with the wires that are all braided together. If your equipment moves around, say it's in a mobile rack or in a mobile station, for example, uh, you can use the flat weave tin braid. Do not use exposed braid from old coax. Um, once you take the coax out of the jacket, the, it begins to loosen up. It's also exposed to oxygen and moisture. And it begins to corrode. It only works as long as it's protected by a jacket. So if you want to use old coax for grounding, and that's not a bad idea, leave it inside the jacket, create a pigtail at each end, Put a terminal on it and waterproof it and just treat it as a big wire, but don't take the braid out of the uh, coax. Anywhere you use any kind of braid, protect the braid from moisture and chemicals. As soon as moisture and chemicals get into the braid and it starts to corrode, particularly at um, RF, it starts to become noisy and a much poorer conductor, even though a voltmeter might tell you at DC 
that it's still perfectly okay. But up in the RF region where we care about, it might not be perfectly okay. Okay, let's talk about AC safety grounding. It has several names when you're doing this grounding. It depends on how um, old your electrician is and where you are in the country. Uh, the official term is equipment ground. And then it's also called third wire ground or green wire ground because mostly ground wires are um, uh, covered with green insulation. Anyway, uh, you wanna keep your ground connections low resistance for safety grounding because their function is to carry enough current if there is a fault like a short circuit so that the protective component in your uh, AC power system, like a circuit breaker or a fuse, will open up and remove power, de-energize that circuit with the fault. And that's why it has to be low resistance and it has to be as big a wire as uh, the hot and the neutral wires are. The purpose of AC safety, safety grounding is twofold and twofold only. It provides a path back to the AC common point for these fault currents I just described also leakage current from an insulation failure or uh, something like that, so that the current doesn't go through you. Uh, it goes back to the AC common point and trips a breaker. It also, uh, all these connections to the earth, your AC safety grounding has a ground electrode, a ground rod outside, and each power pole has some kind of a ground uh, bus, uh, has a, it's either connected to the ground bus of the AC system, or it has a ground rod or a ground uh, wire that comes down the pole and wraps around the pole at the bottom. Even though these ground connections may not be the best ground conditions, there are so many of them, there are so many thousands of these things that they stabilize the AC power system voltage when there's a fault or a transient such as lightning. So that's the only thing that AC grounding is for. It has nothing to do um, really with uh, RF and it has little to do with lightning. Here's what your um, AC safety grounding looks like at your house. Up at the power pole, there's a utility transformer. It's just a center tap transformer like we've learned about um, in our electronics, it's just bigger. You have two heavy black phases that come off of here. Each side of the uh, center tap transformer secondary uh, has a separate phase, they're out of phase. One's going up while one's, the other one's going down, and there's a neutral connected to the center tap. You can also see the ground conductor there that's connected to the ground rod or the wrap at the bottom of the pole. That goes to your service panel, and if you open up the service panel and take off the uh, cover so you can see all the scary stuff, what you'll see inside are two buses. The neutral bus, which is on your left over here, I'm assuming you can see my uh, cursor, um, that's where all the white wires go. And then there's a ground bus over here. Um, that's where all the bare wires go. And it's bolted directly to the metal of the enclosure, which is also connected to your external grounding electrode, either a ground rod or in some places a concrete slab ground called an oofer ground. In your main safety, uh, in your main panel, you will have a safety uh, connection between these two buses called the main bonding jumper and that connects your neutral to your ground at the AC service entrance. This is your AC service common point, and that's what the function of AC safety grounding is in your house, to get any fault or leakage current back to this point. Bear in mind, there are also special rules about subpanels. If you install a subpanel in your garage or your basement or an outbuilding, uh, look up what you're supposed to do with this main bonding jumper and whether you're supposed to have um, an external ground rod, follow those rules. You can create a significant electrocution hazard by improperly grounding subpanels, uh, and people are killed by them every year. Um, and a lot of us install um, extra subpanels in these different locations. So find out what the rules are in the NEC handbook or a how to guide and follow them. Speaking of how to guides, here's um, a good idea. Um, I know we're all ham radio operators, and so uh, we, are, we are proud to know that we know everything. Well, we don't really know everything. Uh, if you aren't sure that you know what you're doing uh, with your AC wiring, get a how-to reference. And this is my favorite. It's by Black & Decker. It's called The Complete Guide to Wiring. It costs less than $20. It's available at the big box stores, and it's available online. 
It's a great book and has pictures of everything you need to do. I know that uh, most of us can install a branch circuit or circuit breaker, whatever. Some of us might even be able to install a three-way switch. But um, there are so many interesting and unusual things that you can install in your house these days. Um, get a how-to guide. It will show you what to do and what not to do, what to ground, what not to ground, how to do it, what the connections look like. It's a great book. Follow the rules for the subpanels and the outbuildings. I just mentioned they are in this book as well. Once you're done, if you've done anything significant, it's not a bad idea to hire a pro electrician to come over and inspect your work if you don't have them do the work um, uh, outright. He can look over your shoulder um, and tell you, um, hey, uh, this is a good way to do this, but you might wanna do this a little bit differently. Um, maybe you can hire an electrical inspector and she can come over and do the same thing. But it's good to have somebody that knows what they're doing. Take a look at your work if you're not uh, really, really familiar with what you're doing. Remember that local code, local building code is the law. And um, that is the, the province of a thing called the authority having jurisdiction. Usually it's a county building department or a city building department. It's not there to make your life difficult although sometimes it does. Um, some people say it's just there to make work for electricians, and sometimes it is. But generally, the building codes and electrical codes are there to uh, protect you and uh, keep from burning down the house. So it's a good idea to follow the code um, as much as you can. Okay, let's talk about lightning protection. Lightning comes from thousands and thousands of feet up in the air. Um, so you're not going to steer it. Once it gets close, it's pretty much made the decision where it's going to go. But you can help Mr. Lightning make good decisions. Um, some are better than others. How can you do that? You want to give Mr. Lightning a heavy, direct path to the earth to dissipate charge in the ground. That's what lightning is all about, rebalancing charge imbalances between the atmosphere and the earth and there's a lot of current involved. So give that current a heavy direct path to the earth. That's where it wants to go. Give it that, that path. In this environment, inductance is more important than resistance. And why? It's because the voltage across anything with inductance is proportional to the amount of inductance times the rate of change of current. And in a lightning strike, we're talking kiloamps per microsecond. That's pretty fast, that's pretty big. And so when you're talking kiloamps per microsecond, it doesn't take very many nano henrys to make a significant amount of voltage. A 12, number 12 wire, a foot long, when hit with a kiloamp per microsecond uh, current pulse can develop hundreds of volts in the end, just a straight piece of wire, not connected to anything. So inductance, you need to minimize it you do that by using the, the big strap and the heavy wires. All of the paths that you give lightning should be outside your residence, hopefully for obvious reasons. You do not want to invite lightning into your residence or your any kind of a building. Um, you want to get, make all these paths outside. So don't make it easy for lightning to go through your station on the way to the earth. It won't even notice. It's coming from thousands of feet away. So a little six foot detour or whatever, just don't give it a path through your house. And here's a key part of lightning protection. This is called a single point ground panel. And uh, what it is, is an aluminum or a copper panel, sheet of metal, um, maybe a couple feet by a foot, or if you've got a lot of connections, something a little bigger. And what you do is you mount all of your surge and uh, protectors and your lightning arresters on this panel. The panel, as you can see, is connected to your station ground bus. It's also connected to your external perimeter or lightning ground system, which we'll talk about in a minute. Your external services like data, um, data boxes or telephone boxes or cable TV boxes, all of those services are required to uh, also have a ground connection. So connect them to your, your perimeter. And this also needs to uh, connect to your AC service entry ground. You mount all of these protectors, including one for your AC power, 
um, on this panel. And then what that accomplishes is, first of all, they've got a common ground connection. And all of the voltages on the outside of these cables are going to go up and down together. You won't get one cable at several hundred or a thousand volts different than the other cables. So you've got unprotected lines coming in. You notice this line through the middle of the panel here. Um, keep your unprotected stuff on one side and your protected stuff on the other side. Even though it looks neat to bundle all of the cables together, um, if you bundle protected and, under, uh, and unprotected together with protected, then you will find that, um, hopefully not, but uh, lightning can jump from the unprotected side to the protected side quite easily. So keep them separated. It's, it was a revelation to me in learning about this that I should mount an AC power protector on or near this single point ground panel as well. And the reason that you do this is so that all of the protectors, when they get hit by a lightning surge or something like that, the voltages all go up and down together at the same time. These pulses can be thousands of volts and they don't last very long, microseconds or milliseconds. And if all of the protectors are not at the same place, they will fire at different times. And that means you, even though they all fire, you can still have thousands of volts of difference between pieces of equipment when one fires and the other has not. So you wanna keep them all together on this panel or very close together. And uh, typically you can run your entire station at least not the amplifiers but the uh, computers and the radios and stuff off of one or two um, heavy outlets from a single branch circuit and so that's what kind of uh, surge protector you mount on this panel and that creates what's called a, a protected line duplex outlet pldo let's take a look and see what some of that looks like this over here is a pldo and it's made by Isobar Trip Lights, available uh, from a variety of distributors. Uh, these basically have MOVs and other components inside of them. They're rated by the amount of energy they can absorb. Um, and they give you two or four or six or eight regular AC outlets. And you plug this into a, an unprotected branch circuit and you protect all your protect, you plug all your protected equipment into these uh, outlets. Uh, they're not expensive. Uh, a four outlet item like this that has more than 3,000 joules of, of protection costs less than $50. Um, so these are well within the budget of ham stations. Down here are the um, antenna uh, feed line lightning protectors or arresters that we've become familiar with over the years. They have a gas, a gas discharge tube that goes between the center conductor and the shield of the feed lines. They don't protect the outside of the field line, feed line, just the signals inside. And so um, when a big surge comes down the feed line, the gas discharge tube fires, it creates an arc which inside, which is a very low voltage and that arc holds the voltage down and clamps the voltage until the, it extinguishes because it doesn't have enough current. There are two kinds of uh, protectors. One uh, passes DC and the other one does not. It has a series capacitor. If you are running your feed line to something that needs DC power, uh, make sure you use a DC pass uh, protector. Don't ask how I learned this. Uh, if you put a blocked DC blocked uh, arrestor in the line, suddenly your remote coax switch and your preamps won't work anymore. So make sure you buy the right kind. Uh, this is a uh, protector for a phone line. Uh, this is typical of what you find for a rotator protector or data service. Um, you can see it has little gas discharge tubes, these small barrel things. The things that look like capacitors, those are MOVs. And these things that look like transistors are transorbs, which are back-to-back -back zeners. And they clamp at low voltage and protect these uh, sensitive lines. Back to the single point ground panel. Um, all of your grounds for all of the entry paths must be bonded together. And that's what the single point ground panel does. And it's connected to the perimeter ground, which is the outside ground system around your house, uh, whether that consists of 
one big set of ground rods at your AC service entrance. If you're lucky, everything can go to the same entry point, or maybe you have to install some grounds around the outside of your house. And as I discussed before, all protectors will fire at the same time to prevent voltage differences due to the transient timing. This single point ground panel must include non-RF and AC power as well. That includes your rotator control cables um, and uh, switch cables and all this stuff. And make sure you keep your protected and unprotected cables separated. Here's what a single point ground panel looks like. This is at the station of K4RO. He lives on a hilltop near uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And um, he's got a great station, but he said, you know, um, every time a thunderstorm came through, I was losing some piece of equipment, a filter, a switch, something was getting blown up. And he got tired of it. So he put this big panel in his garage. His shack is right above this. The garage is sort of in the basement. And so this big panel is mounted on a cinder block wall. And you can see up at the right, this uh, big heavy copper wire that goes outside to the ground system. And everything associated with his antennas is mounted on this panel. The switches, the filters, the stubs, the uh, decoders, all that stuff. You can see a stack matching system over there, the blue box. It's all mounted on this panel. Keeps it all at the same voltage during uh, transient events like lightning. And he says, since he put this up several years ago, he hasn't lost any pieces of equipment to lightning damage. Okay, single point ground panel. Here's one in my station. Um, I have some external single point ground panels and entry panels, but in my station, I have two operating positions, operating system A and operating position B. And in the middle is just a basically a big six foot metal rack. And I got this for free. People give these away all the time. And so all the uh, equipment that's connected to my antenna system, the rotators, the amplifiers, um, the uh, switches, the antenna switches down here, are all bonded to this rack with heavy ground wires. And that one big piece of metal acts as a single point ground panel. Um, you can see my isobar uh, PLDO down here at the bottom. It's also mounted on the rack. And it's plugged into one circuit um, in my house. In the back of the rack, you can see I have a panel here with my uh, power switching on it. Um, and here's my amplifiers, and here's uh, my uh, 115 volt switching off of a power strip and down here is an antenna protector and these are all bonded together with heavy wires they're bolted to the rack and you can see a heavy wire that goes out to my perimeter ground system and you can see a wire coming in from operating position a and you can see a wire coming in from operating position b those are number six stranded and i just bought a 500 foot spool of um, number six stranded. I don't think it was 500 feet. It was maybe, um, I bought, you buy it by the pound um, at that size. I bought a, a small spool of this stuff. And so I use it all the time when I'm grounding and I make sure I have the right stuff on hand and I don't scrimp or uh, cut corners. Okay, let's talk about this perimeter ground system that I've mentioned several times. It is a requirement in building codes and um, for good design that all of your external earth connections must be, the word is shall, uh, be connected together. They must be bonded. This is a required thing. Um, if you've got, here's your AC service entry, it's got an external ground rod. Okay, the telephone lady comes and she hooks up your telephone system. She's got to put in a ground rod or ground connection of some sort. That's her rule. Same thing for television. And uh, maybe you put a FM antenna up on your house. The NEC requires you to run a, a big wire down to an external uh, ground electrode. Well, if you don't connect all these things together, what are they connected together with? And the answer is dirt. Okay, so dirt is not very conductive. If you took a voltmeter and you connected it one probe over here and one probe over here, you might read 10 ohms, you might read 20 ohms, you might read 50 ohms or 100 ohms, what happens if you get a 1,000 amp current surge flowing in the ground, which is not uncommon, between this ground rod and that ground rod, and they have 10 ohms between them? You get 10,000 volts between this ground system and this ground system. So suddenly your AC service ground 
is 10,000 volt different than your telephone ground. And that's when you hear stories about people just sitting there minding their own business. And suddenly there's a flash outside and a big green arc jumps between the power uh, circuit and their telephone and now nothing in the house works anymore. It's because the ground systems were not tied together and so they did not go up and down together and they were at wildly different voltages and there was a destructive arc. Okay, so outside you connect every one of these ground rods together with heavy wire. That's at number six, whatever, number four, whatever you've got, bond them together, uh, make those connections solid with properly rated clamps, or you can use those thermit uh, welding one shots, which are a lot of fun to use, I gotta say. Um, and you create this ring of protection around your house. Maybe it goes all the way around your house, but maybe you can't make it go all the way around your house because of a driveway or something like that, or a patio. Make it go as far as you can so that you can connect all of these different systems that come to your house, connect their ground rods together, and that includes your station. So we talked about not creating low impedance paths through your station. Here's an example of why. Okay, so you have a tower outside and um, and it's properly built. It's got an antenna on it, everything's okay. And Mr. Lightning comes for a visit. Maybe he doesn't hit the tower directly. Maybe he just hits a nearby tree or power line or something. You still have big currents flowing up and down your tower from the magnetic field. So here comes the current, flows along the feed line, You've made this nice entry panel over here and you connected it to a ground rod just like you were supposed to. Okay, so the lightning current divides just like all current does in accordance with the impedance of any path that's available to it. So a lot of it may go through this uh, ground connection right here, but your feed lines are very low impedance too. And they go into your radio room or uh, whatever, and it'll go right through your radios into the power uh, circuit that you've got the radios uh, supplied from, that'll go back to your AC service entry. Why does it do that? Well, there's this cool uh, ground electrode over here. So this is also a good place for lightning. Remember, lightning just wants to get to the earth and it will take any path available to it. So if that path happens to go through your, your station on the way to the ground rod over here on the other side of the house, it'll do it. Um, so. Don't give it that path if you can. Well, how do you avoid that? Okay, you've created this wonderful perimeter ground system. Here's your single point ground panel outside the house. You've got a heavy ground connection here. The ground may be uh, close enough to your tower that you connect it to the tower as well. You've got all these ground rods outside. They're all bonded together. Your AC service entry is bonded to that as well. Okay, lightning comes in along the uh, AC service. A lot of it is going to go through this uh, beautiful ground system that you've connected to it. You've given it a heavy, direct connection to the earth to discharge itself and disperse that charge. Some of it's going to try to flow through this unprotected AC branch circuit. Sure it is, but you've got an AC power protector over here on your surge, uh, uh, surge protector on your single point ground panel. So, in before it gets to your equipment, it encounters this surge protector and that routes it down to the ground. That's what you want. So all of the paths that are really available to lightning that are low impedance, direct heavy paths are protected in some way. And that avoids having um, lightning flow through your equipment on the way to the ground. Out at the tower, let's look down at a tower. Here's a typical lattice tower. It's mounted on a concrete tower base. Maybe you tied the uh, tower to some rebar inside the base, so that also acts like a ground electrode. Each tower leg should have a ground rod nearby, maybe uh, just outside the tower base, no farther than six feet away. And each leg has a ground rod, and those ground rods are all tied together with a ground ring, uh, a big heavy piece of wire. Okay, that's a good ground system right there. But what the commercial guys do is um, add some radials to this. And so they dig a little trench and they put in some more ground wires and some more ground rods. As long as the backhoe person is over at your house, have the operator dig a trench out from your tower. It doesn't have to be a huge trench. We're not talking about 
the sewer line here and um, give you an opportunity to lay down some radial wire and some ground rods. Connect those to the ground ring and your ground rods back here at the tower. That really works well. Um, it is the first spot that lightning coming in your antenna system has an opportunity to get to the ground, and that's a good, heavy, direct path. Along your tower, you want to make sure you bond your feed lines to the tower every 50 feet or so. Why? Because the tower has inductance, and if it's hit by a lightning or has a heavy uh, nearby strike, you can have 100,000 volts between the top and the bottom of the 50-foot tower. Now, if your feed lines are not bonded to the tower, I don't know too many coax jackets that are rated for 100,000 volts. So that lightning will arc between the shield of your feed line right through the jacket to get to the tower. That creates pinholes and splits. It might even blow up your feed lines entirely. So every 50 feet or so, yes, it's a pain in the neck. You've got to cut the line. You've got to add connectors. You've got to waterproof them. You put in one of these brackets or use a coax bonding kit from a company like Andrews and uh, make sure your feed lines are tied to your tower. If you've got an insulated base tower, put a spark gap down at the bottom, which can be as simple as two pieces of heavy wire that are simply close together. I just made an X with a couple of pieces of number two solid copper, and I separated them into the point that is about a millimeter and a half uh, to the point where I got enough distance between them that when I run a full legal limit, and I have a little SWR on the tower, it does not arc over. But lightning will arc over, and it's just like a gas discharge tube. That arc will clamp the voltage and help that lightning get to ground. This is what a single point ground panel looks like at a tower base. I have three towers. They're on a uh, sort of a modest ridge, nothing like you have out of there in Denver, but pretty good for Missouri. And I call it the Crawford County Cumulonimbus Discharge Facility. I know the towers have been hit. So um, I took extra protection and at the base of each tower, I took a surplus uh, electrical box. I put a piece of flashing. This is my single point ground panel right here. Just aluminum flashing from the store, mounted it on some plywood and I mounted my uh, remote coax switch on it. This is an RCS4L that has a gas discharge tube on each one of the antennas. You can see the antenna cables here. And you can see my feed line, which is buried hard line right here. You can see the heavy ground conductor right here. And that's connected right to the switch, which is mounted right on the single point ground panel. Here's my irrigation cable. Let me save you some serious money here. If you've got a long run of rotator control cable, like for a tail twister or a ham M, it takes eight conductors. Two of those conductors have to be heavy conductors because they control the solenoid for the brake. Well, that's expensive cable. I don't know what it costs these days. It's upwards of 50 cents a foot. Um, but you can buy irrigation system control cable for a lot less expensive than uh, the special rotator cable. This is 10 conductor number 18. And a pair of number 18s twisted together are the same as a number 16. So what I did was combine two pairs of number 18 for my solenoid circuits over here, and the rest are lighter for the motor and the indicator. This is direct burial PVC sheath, and you can buy it in thousand foot spools for way cheaper than you can buy a thousand feet of special rotator cable. And then use the special rotator cable to go up your tower if you want, or make a flexible loop or use it inside your station. Each one of the conductors of that cable as a gas discharge tube. That's what these things are. I buy them in a big box of, of 100 from Mauser, and um, I simply put a sheet metal screw into the flashing, and I connect one gas discharge tube to each line. These are 75-volt gas discharge tubes from TDK. Now go back and read Ron Block's in our uh, in R2B's 2002 QST articles about lightning protection, what lightning is, and how to protect yourself. Ron develops the concept of a protected zone. That's what this red box is. And you put all of the equipment that you want to protect inside this protected zone. And then you find every wire that crosses the boundary of that zone and you protect it. You have to protect it. If you don't protect every wire, lightning will get in on the unprotected wire and then it can be just as bad if you don't have any 
uh, protection at all. And then within that zone, bond all of the equipment together so that it all goes up and down at the same time, all the same voltage. That's so important. Okay, let's talk about RF management. All that RF that's got floating around in your station. The first thing you need to realize is everything in the station is an antenna, and I mean everything. Uh, and the, the worse you want it not to uh, act as an antenna, the better it will be. It's a Murphy's Law. But everything in your station is part of your antenna system. Your feed line, your ground system, your tuners, your jumpers, your radios, your mic cables, you, your conductive, your PCs, all your control stuff, uh, that's all part of your antenna system. And it's within the near field of your antennas at HF. It's like if you've got a 40 meter dipole in your backyard, what's the wavelength of 40 meters? Well, it's 40 meters, that's 130 feet. So most uh, radio stations are within a wavelength or two of the uh, antennas. And that means you're right in the near field and they're going to couple a lot of energy from your transmitted signal. Even at 100 watts, you can start to get a significant amount of RF into your station. What do you do about that? Okay, well, first of all, forget about trying to create some magic zero volt RF ground. It's just not going to work. Concentrate instead on bonding. Bond everything together, and I'll say it again, so everything goes up and down together. So that everything's as a, close to the same voltage as possible. You might not be able to create zero volts, but you can create a zero volt difference. And that's the important thing. You've got to keep your connections electrically short um, that go from the back of the radio to your ground bus or whatever, so that they don't start acting like transmission lines and that helps everything stay at the same voltage. If you install an amplifier, you're going to have extra high RF field strength Plus, you're going to meet the neighbors. So anyway, you want to have extra bonding goodness. So you got to apply extra attention to make sure everything's bonded together. And what really helps is to create a common reference plane. It looks like a ground plane um, in your station, or sometimes it's called a ground bus. And you've seen this picture probably a million times in the license manuals and the handbooks and all sorts of other things. Ah, my cat wants to get on the computer. She says, cat daddy, what are you doing? Okay, so working on bonding inside the shack, you create some kind of a ground reference uh, reference plane, or you use a piece of copper pipe. Everybody seems to go get this piece of half-inch copper pipe, and you connect it to all of your equipment using little short pieces of wire or braid or strap and you've got to use the right kind of a clamp on the uh, pipe. Use screws or ground clamps, the actual ground clamps that are made for ground rods. Use hose clamps, those stainless steel things. They will loosen up. They're not made to be electrical connectors. I know we use them a lot for that, but they're not made for that, and they will thermally cycle and loosen up, particularly in the house where you uh, keep them warm. So don't use hose clamps, use screws or ground clamps. When you create this ground plane or ground bus, you eliminate hot spots because everything's at the same voltage. And you also reduce a uh, buzz and hum in your audio signals, which is more important these days than ever because we use low level audio for digital signals that go in and out of the microphone connector. So any kind of buzz or hum is gonna cause problem with your digital communications. It also reduces RFI from common mode current. Common mode meaning flowing on the outside of shields or on all of your, uh, uh, your twisted pair wires or whatever. RFI is caused by current, uh, current getting where it should not be. And what causes current? Voltage. So voltage differences between pieces of equipment create common mode current. So by eliminating voltage differences, you can also reduce RFI in your station. And it also reduces sensitivity to physical configuration. But for example, when you move stuff around and suddenly you've got this giant hotspot on 15 meters, or you can't operate on this band if this piece of equipment is connected, all that kind of stuff. When you bond things together, it, that sensitivity tends to go away because it's all bolted together and it's at the same voltage. Okay, we talked about ground loops a little bit before. If you look at this simple drawing, um, you've got 
four pieces of equipment here. Each one of them has two or three cables on it. Uh, you know how many ground loops are in that, that picture? I tried to count them once and I lost count. Uh, I lost uh, interest when I got over 20. Uh, there's a lot of different loops in this drawing and you can't get rid of them. So what can you do? A ground loop causes problems because it's got area um, and uh, that area is created by the length of cable that you use. The amount of electromotive force, EMF, that is induced in a ground loop is directly proportional to the area. So if you keep the cable short and you keep the loop area small, you also minimize the amount of voltage that is induced in the ground loop. So you use short or coiled cables. And if you use a bonding bus or a reference plane, you lay the cables right on this reference plane or you coil them up and you run them right along that ground bus, either use uh, twist ties or Velcro straps or maybe a cable tray to keep them all together and minimize that area. Always use shielded cables as well even for low level uh, switch contacts and stuff like that. If you don't use a shielded cable, RF will happily get on those unshielded conductors and they'll go right into the equipment where they'll cause trouble. So use a shielded cable and a metal enclosure. Always use short straps or wires for the reasons that we've talked about before. Here's a picture. Um, in my station, this is operating position A. I took a Costco table, a poor defenseless Costco banquet table, and I got some 12 inch flashing from the store and I unrolled it along the table and um, I held it down and I took a screw electric screwdriver and I just took some sharp tip uh, stainless steel sheet screws, sheet metal screws. And I just went pow, 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 pow through the uh, flashing and held it down to the table. So don't do this on an antique uh, kitchen table from your grandma. Um, no, I didn't learn that the hard way. So this is bolted onto the table. I set all the radio equipment right on it. All the cables are right on it. What that does is it helps equalize the voltage from the RF coming in from my antennas, which are right outside, so that there aren't a minimum amount of voltage differences along those cables. That's what it looks like. Um, it's just a shiny piece of metal under my radio equipment. You can use a metal desk. You can use a metal rack. Um, if you're going out into a portable situation like for field day, here's a, here's a real good tip for you. Take along tin foil, just aluminum foil, just lay it out on your operating position and you can use clip leads to connect your uh, equipment to it. And believe me, that will help a lot of the portable and field day RFI problems that we've all experienced. Just putting a ground plane down helps so much. Let's review this ground system business. A single solid ground system made of short, heavy, direct connections can satisfy all of those requirements. And uh, I hope I've given you some ideas about how to do that. You've got to bond all your grounds together outside and keep your protectors together on a single point ground panel. Your perimeter ground around your, your building helps keep the lightning currents outside the building and that is really important. And remember that all currents flow on all wires. An AC uh, grounding conductor will happily conduct lightning-induced current, just like it will conduct RF. And uh, maybe your lightning protection ground will conduct some AC uh, safety grounding current as well. Current will flow wherever it has a path. So making this single solid ground system works for all three of those types of requirements. Excuse me. The mobile station. Okay, remember that you're in the antenna in a mobile station, particularly for HF. And so the RF issues can be more intense and you really have to pay a lot of attention to this kind of thing if you're gonna create a really effective mobile station, particularly on HF. You've got special power wiring considerations to worry about, you've got bonding considerations when uh, you're dealing with the vehicle body and you've got to mount antennas right on the vehicle body. It's, it's as if you were uh, mounting an antenna right in your station because you are. In mobile power, uh, you need to worry about fusing and ampacity, which is the ability of wire to carry current and the voltage drop that occurs along that 
uh, that uh, power supply cable. You've got to worry about where to connect your power return. Uh, you're going to power things from the battery. Where does the ground, quote, unquote, ground lead go? And what if you've got a battery monitoring system in your vehicle? Modern systems have these new things, and we're going to talk about what that means in a minute. You've got RF pickup to be uh, concerned about because you're in the antenna system. You're in the antenna. So uh, you're right under the antenna in most cases, and uh, you've got a lot of RF floating around on your control and your uh, feed line cables. And then there's these things called DC-DC boosters in your car that are part of uh, modern vehicles as well. What's the deal with that? Let's talk about fusing ampacity and voltage drop. You want fuses in both leads, both power leads, always. No question about it, because if there's a short circuit in your car, some other system might decide that if it loses its uh, ground connection, your radio equipment might make a dandy path back to the battery. And um, that can be a lot of current, as anybody that's had a short circuit in a vehicle knows. So you want to make sure you have a fuse in your ground lead as well so that it opens if something else tries to drive a lot of current through it. That'll protect your radio. You want to make sure your power connection points are adequately rated. For example, what we used to call a cigarette lighter, uh, and it's now called an auxiliary power socket, those are usually only rated about 7 to 10 amps. And... Um, that's not enough for a full-size HF uh, rig or even a full-size VHF UHF radio that runs 50 to 100 watts. You'll burn those things up. You'll burn the socket up. You may burn the wire up as well. So you're going to have to make sure that you have a heavy-duty power connection, which has to be adequately sized. Remember, you've got, uh, when you're running your power cord in the car, your power cable, um, you've got to take into account that it runs all the way from the battery to your radio and then from the radio all the way back. So include all of that length. How much voltage drop can you accommodate? Remember that mobile radios need at least 11 volts, so your maximum resistance can be calculated. Measure your vehicle's running voltage, figure out how much drop you can handle, and then divide that by the maximum current that your equipment draws. That's the maximum amount of resistance you can have in the power connection to that piece of equipment. For example, if you decide you can only have a half a volt drop in your power wiring and the radio draws 25 amps, you can only have 0.5 divided by 25, which is equal to 0 0.02 ohms. So if you go look in the wire tables and you have a 10-foot power cable, that means 10 foot out and 10 foot back, a total length of 20 feet, you have to use number 10 AWG wire to make sure you don't have more than a half a volt of drop. So be careful about how much voltage your mobile radio really needs. If it gets too low, um, it will start acting squirrely. Your output signal uh, may become unstable. Your microprocessor may not work. The radio may turn itself on and off. Um, make sure you have enough voltage. And don't forget to include connector resistance when you build uh, or specify your cables. Okay, what about this power return connection? What is this battery management system? If you go look at your battery, and it's got one of these doodads on its negative terminal, this is a Hall Effect current sensor that measures the current going into your battery's negative terminal. And this little connection here it is a computer interface, and this goes off to the vehicle's control uh, computer module. What is this for? If you have an engine idle shutoff vehicle, so if you pull up at a traffic light and you uh, stop and the, the engine turns off to save fuel, and then it turns back on, uh, you have a computer program in your car that monitors your battery state at all times, and it needs to know how much current is going in and out of the battery because this EIS stuff puts a lot of uh, stress on the battery and there's a lot of current going in and out. So this is something to know in your car. I have an older car. It doesn't have a battery sensor in it. Um, but if you've got anything after about 2012, it's going to have a battery management system in it. What does that mean for power wiring? 
Okay, so you want to do home run wiring, which is everything goes back to the proper chassis ground point. From your battery sensor, follow the big wire down into the bowels of your engine compartment, and you will find a spot where all the big wires come together. Your starter motor, your battery return cable, stuff like um, your headlight returns, things like that. That all comes to this chassis ground point. That may be on the body of the vehicle or it may be on the engine block. That's where you connect your DC return, not to the negative battery terminal if you have a battery sensor up here. That ensures that any current that your radio draws from the battery is included in the calculations the computer does about the state of your battery. If you don't do that, if you have a battery management system and you connect your DC return up here to the negative terminal, the battery will eventually discharge over time because your radio is taking current out of the battery that the BMS system doesn't know about and it won't charge your battery back up all the way. So connect your DC return back here to the chassis ground point. If you don't have a battery management system, you can connect it directly to the negative terminal. Okay. Can, can I interrupt you for just a second? Sure. Uh, uh, Jeff put the uh, drawing link on the chat. So if you're, if you want to get in the drawing for the uh, HRO gift certificate, uh, go to the chat and uh, and do that. Uh, or how much about how much more you got to go, Ward? Oh, just a few more slides. Okay, go ahead. You bet. Yeah, it's a, it's a fire hose of a talk. Okay, um, if you got RF concerns on your power, twist the wires together and install ferrite cores up here on your radio. Uh, that's where you do it uh, if you want to keep RF out of your um, power wiring. The DC to DC boosters are there so that when your engine does shut off, all of your electronics doesn't shut off with it um, and, uh, and do that thing that electronics do when you start your car and they turn off and they turn back on. You don't want to do that at every traffic light. So the vehicle has a DC to DC booster to take whatever battery voltage there and keep a steady voltage to your car electronics. Don't run your ham gear off that booster. It's not rated for it. Install your own DC to DC booster and it needs a DC power return that's home run wiring just like the radios. Okay, bonding in the mobile station. Uh, you are Your body components are not always well bonded together. They're not even metallic all the time now, so we can't just assume that um, uh, a body panel is gonna be connected to the DC ground system. We have to give up that idea. Um, when you're looking for a ground point, don't, do the, uh, don't use the subsystem ground points like for your computer system or for your headlights because um, you could inject excess current into that, cause a DC voltage drop that they're not expecting and that can upset the subsystem operation. So, use home run wiring back to the battery uh, or to the chassis ground point. Bonding to the body, you might, you might do it, um, but be aware that you're creating new return and RF pass, and that might lead to unpredictable performance. Protect any connection that you make with bonding with anti-corrosion compound that's designed for vehicle use, so it won't wash away, uh, it won't uh, uh, dry up, and it's, it's intended for use in cars and trucks. When you're mounting uh, your equipment, remember that single pieces of gear really don't need to be bonded to your vehicle. Uh, they can work just fine. For example, I think we've all done this. We've gotten a mobile radio for VHF, UHF, hooked it up and then stuffed it between the driver's seat and the transmission hump, and it worked perfectly fine without a ground connection. These modern radios are not designed to require a, um, a ground to the vehicle. You can connect it if you want to, but they don't need it. Uh, remember that a body panel is part of the antenna system, and it may be hot with RF. So what you think you're bonding to to reduce voltage may actually increase it, depending on where your antenna is and what kind of vehicle and how it's made. You may want to consider an isolated subpanel. And don't bond control heads to the body because they're not designed for that. And by creating a separate ground path, you may result in really uh, strange behavior by the control head. Uh, use the separation kit. Make sure that you have a strong mechanical connection for the control head, but you do not have to ground it. Don't do it.
unless the manufacturer tells you to. Another good way of dealing with it is the standalone mini, mac, mini racks, truck toolboxes, carry case stations. Um, having them be portable and disconnectable uh, is convenient, but it also may create a security issue to so make sure you have them secured uh, out of sight or under the seat or something. Um, these are easy to bond internally, so all your equipment is well bonded together. And these do not have to be bonded to the vehicle. Mechanical security is paramount. Um, you do not want radios flying around in your passenger compartment if you have a, a sudden stop or an accident. Make sure you tie them down uh, under the seat uh, to some kind of a, a body screw so that they don't go flying around. And watch out for airbags. There are airbags in front of you, above you, and behind you. Uh, I mean, to the side of you. And um, if you mount something in front of that airbag, like a microphone or a control head, and that airbag fires, um, it's coming at you at 100 miles an hour, and so is whatever you mounted on the front of it. So you do not want uh, things mounted in front of your airbags to hit you uh, when they fire. Ask the dealer or have the service department show you where the airbags are if you don't know and stay well clear of it. Um, you can also use the channels under the trim strips in your car to run wiring. Uh, it helps shield the wiring from your RF and it protects the cables mechanically. Watch out for hidden wiring when you're um, drilling holes in your vehicle. Uh, uh, be advised that manufacturers often run uh, wires through hidden areas that you can't see. So put a little sleeve over your drill bit so it can only go in uh, just the thickness of the metal and doesn't plunge into this space. You don't want to find out that's where a 12 volt power wire or an expensive network cable run. Service bulletin and repair manuals may help you uh, in this, uh, in this uh, process of finding a good way to mount the equipment. At the antenna, you want to bond to the body right there. The through panel NMO is probably the best quality uh, antenna mount. Uh, lip mount needs an additional body bond at HF. The little set screws aren't quite enough to give you a good connection. So maybe a heavy wire to a nearby body screw. Things that are painted and coated, um, they have really good paint and coatings now. So stuff that looks like it's uh, attached directly together, if both things were painted first, they may not be connected together at all. Mag mounts don't work well at HF because there's only 100 picofarad per, uh, per magnet. So uh, the coax shield becomes part of the antenna, which creates RFI from common mode. So what you do is you put an extra body bonding wire um, on the mount to a body screw. That's also part of the antenna, by the way. And then decouple the feed line at the antenna and at the radio to prevent RFI from antennas. If you're buying a vehicle and planning a new uh, station in it, talk to the salespeople about an upfit package. That's one term for it, where you say, I want to install a radio in this car. Is there a radio installation upfit package? They're not that expensive. You can get a heavy duty alternator, some uh, uh, mounting brackets, and um, uh, that will help you do things properly in a way that the manufacturer expects. If the salespeople don't know about these things, talk to their fleet sales or the resales guys. They will definitely know about um, uh, radio packages because they sell to public safety, they sell to delivery vehicles, they sell to taxis, all that kind of stuff. A service department can also help you uh, tell you how uh, to mount a radio in a car. There are service bulletins about mounting radios that you can get. And car audio and two-way radio shops are full of professionals that know all about this stuff and can install things properly for you. So are you done yet? Yes, I've given you a big long fire hose of information about uh, grounding and bonding. And believe it or not, we're at the end of the show. So I wanna thank you all for your attention. I'm sorry we didn't have the video to go along with this. I can take some Q&A and then there's three more slides after this with standards and other references for the interested reader and you can ask Jeffrey for those. So I'm standing by for uh, comments and I will stop sharing and put myself back on screen. Hey, there I am again. So, do we have some questions? 
so there's, there's one. Yeah, go ahead. Well, there's one. There's one question in the chat from James. Uh, it says, suppose you're operating that battery powered station and dipole outdoors on field day as a ground rod still necessary in fair weather. Uh, I don't think a ground rod is going to do much for you um, because to protect yourself from lightning, you really need a fairly extensive connection. A ground rod, some uh, people like to put in a ground rod uh, for AC safety. They put one at the generator and they put one at the station. If, you're, if you have more than one station, make good and sure that you have a heavy conductor in your extension cord so that your ground rod is bonded well to the generator uh, ground rod. You don't want to create an electrocution hazard um, with a poor uh, grounding connection between two different points. But no, um, you got a dipole and a radio, a ground rod isn't going to buy you a lot. I think if you have lightning in the vicinity, the best thing to do is disconnect your cable, throw it away from somewhere out on the ground uh, from the uh, radio, and don't be near it. Well, Jerry, so far we oh. have 20, 20 responses to the door prize. Okay. Uh, everybody had an opportunity, hopefully, to uh, uh, do the door prize. If uh, uh, Ward wants to hang around for a bit, we'll do the door prize. And uh, I know it's getting uh, uh, 830, so uh, uh, if he wants to hang around and you want to hang around and ask a question, yeah, I can, let's I can do the drawing. Questions here, so. so. Okay. Uh, if you want to so, do the drawing and then ask questions, I'm happy to do that. We will do that. So I guess fire away, Jeff. And the way this works, the computer the computer picks the uh, it shuffles them and picks it. So that's how that's how the uh, drawing works if you didn't know that. I think Jeff is doing it. Okay, so I did the randomized sort out of, we ended up with 22 entries. Uh, the winner is Larry Irons, K0LAI. Larry Irons, okay. Okay, Larry, well, we know you, so we'll, we will get the... Uh, he says, "You who? <laughs> okay, we'll get the uh, <coughs> Kathy. will get the certificate into you, and uh, appreciate everybody participating. So we'll we'll uh, we'll open it up uh, to ask uh, Ward questions. And and Ward, well, we appreciate very much you taking your time to do this. Very interesting, very thorough, and it is a lot of material. But yeah, uh, I picked up some." Good points myself. So uh, it covers a lot of ground. A lot of ground, exactly. <laughs> How about so, if I run through some of the questions in the chat and people can think about their. Sure, uh, go right ahead. Ray right asked ahead. Uh, early on uh, Can you elaborate on the SBGP mounting location? Can it be in the shack or external? Uh, the most common place for these things is where your feed lines enter your, your building. Often that's just on the other side of the wall in your station. Um, so that's, that's a good location for that stuff. If you have to bring the cables into your station, um, the grounding can be in your station right there to mount the AC protector, but the AC protector needs to be mounted on this panel along with, um, the, uh, lightning protectors, or it needs to be very close to it. Say you have a, an external panel where your, uh, feed lines are all nicely dressed and come, uh, up to the side of the house. You can mount the AC protector on the inside of that wall, but run a nice strap through the wall to connect to your SPGP. It just has to be a short, direct connection. And Peter asked about, do gas discharge tubes have to be replaced periodically? No, they don't wear out. They don't, um, they don't get gassy. They're already gassy. So um, unless, uh, unless they blow up, uh, unless you open up the, the protector and you see two little leads with nothing between them, um, then you don't have to replace them. If you want to test them, the place to take them is to a uh, motor rewind shop. They will have a thing called a high pot tester. 
high potential tester and you tell the uh, the shop guys um, how much voltage these things are rated at and they will put it on the tester and they'll run it up um, in voltage with a current limited supply and if your gas discharge tube is okay they'll run it all the way up to the rated voltage and it will not arc over if it arcs over below that yes you do need to uh, replace it if it's a, ga a glass cartridge gdt you can look at it with a magnifying glass and if you see pitting or uh, uh, carbon deposits or something like that on the electrodes yeah replace it but generally they they are one time fail and when they fail they fail and it's not um, it's pretty obvious when you look at it um and we talked Powered station, oh, battery powered stations needing ground rods when powering a dipole. Um, if your whole station is floating, and this also goes to the second floor station question, um, if your whole station is floating, um, what you're, you're not talking about AC safety protection, but you are still exposed to lightning. Lightning's going to come into your station along your feed lines, and you've got to give it a path to the earth somehow. And, it, and lightning will not care if you're AC powered or, or battery powered. So I want to reiterate, you're trying to direct, uh, you're trying to encourage lightning, let me put it that way, to make a good decision and go to the ground outside your house. Um, let's see. And multiple AC surge protectors. As long as they are all on the same panel, you're okay. Or if you feed them from one common uh, protected surge protector. For example, these power strips, I think is what we're talking about here that claim to be surge protected. Um, what you need is one big honking surge protector on your uh, SPGP, and then you can run extension cords or power strips or what have you from a protected outlet to where you're going to uh, run your equipment. Hope that is kind of clear. Um, and Brian is pointing a tower on his roof on the opposite side of my AC service entry. Of course you are. It's federal law that the station has to be all the way on the other side of the house from your AC service panel to make it as hard as possible. Should I run the antenna cable and grounding on the outside of the roof or the inside of the attic? Boy, I'd run it on the outside of the, the roof. I would run it down to the edge of the roof and then create some kind of a cable tray maybe just use some plastic gutter or something um, uh, to run it along your house don't run unprotected cables through your attic if you can avoid it um, or your crawl space for that matter you're just asking for it and um, uh, i'm sorry to put it that way but you know uh, inviting lightning into the house in any way is just a real problem okay Many electricians refer to having less than 25 ohms between ground points. Electricians care about 60 hertz, okay? They don't care too much about lightning protection and they sure don't care about RF in your shack. Um, when th what they want is a good solid connection for AC safety grounding and 25 ohms is tolerable. And when you're talking about lightning protection, and a lot of current flowing through the soil, you can get thousands of volts just between a few feet, points a few feet different on the ground. So you definitely want to bond all external connections to the earth, all your ground rods, whatever you've got, bond them together. Um, yes, it's a pain in the neck, but um, it's a good thing to do. Bond them all together with heavy wire. How do you measure over long distances? You don't. Um, it's very difficult to measure widely separated points, um, and frankly, there isn't a lot of value to this. I think at this point, it gets. I used to be um, a systems engineer for a medical firm, and we had to deal with questions like this all the time, particularly for qualifying components. And, and there was there were three ways of, of accepting a practice or a component. You could test it. In this case, you could test the ground impedance between two points, but that's very difficult. Or you can analyze um, the component or the system, and you can 
crank up your formulas and your tables and all this kind of stuff. And you can say, okay, this is a validated equation or formula. And I can tell that this is acceptable or I can look at history. Um, I've done this before a million times and it has never failed. So you have some confidence that this is an acceptable technique. In the case of lightning protection, what you need to do is rely on the expertise that has been painfully acquired by electricians and communications systems engineers over many years. And when they tell you to bond stuff together and when they tell you to curve wires in the direction of the ground system and all these other obscure things do that because um, they have learned the hard way what happens when you do not so when you're talking about bonding stuff together outside for example a, a common question is my tower is 50 feet from my house should i bond it to my ground system the general rule if you talk to the military people mill standard 419 anything under 200 feet separate from the, the station shall be bonded. If you talk to um, usual, uh, the more consumer type uh, lightning protection, anything over 50 feet, uh, under 50 feet should be bonded to your uh, lightning protection system. Problem is the farther away you get, the more inductance you get in that connector and the less effective it becomes as a bonding conductor. So. Uh, the nice thing about bonding conductors is they're buried. They're another ground radio, radio for you. Uh, I just recommend people bond a tower to their house grounding system if it's anywhere as close to the house. If it's way out on a field someplace, that's up to you. And finally, daisy chaining surge protectors do not um, get one big quality, high quality, um, highly rated, surge protector for your AC system, mount it on or close to your grounding panel, and then run everything off of that. Daisy chaining surge protector doesn't work because they surge protect at different points in time. This one fires, then this one fires, then this one fires, and you've got all that inductance between them. And what you create is a, uh, a big mess uh, where the equipment that you supposedly protected suddenly is uh, hundreds or thousands of volts uh, difference and things get broken. So that's my answer. So now if anybody's got a, a verbal question, I'm open to take it. Did I wear everybody out? <laughs> I grounded them. I ground, wore them down to the ground. Yeah, it, it's, it's a fire hose. That's very interesting. Really a Appreciate, like I say, your time, and uh, I guess if there's no others, I guess uh, Jeff has the slides, and uh, yeah, Jeff has the slides. I'm sorry it didn't work out with the video because oh, well. I have all these little interpretive dances that I do during the talk, you know, up and down together, and make the voltages the same, and all this kind of thing. Well, this is not the first time we've encountered. Uh, Jeff's real good about checking with our presenters, and <laughs> you know, Murphy comes in and slugs you so jeff and i had this working just fine so whatever anyway folks it's been thank you i get out to denver every once in a while a beautiful place so enjoy yeah, your look up denver radio club we're easy to find okay 73 right. i'm headed I'm downstairs bye-bye thank thanks, you thanks Gordon. are we out of here i think we're out of here Thanks everybody that's left. Looks like we got about 30 of you, so. Interesting presentation. A lot of knowledge there. Good, good speaker. Good night, everybody. Good night. See you Wednesday, Jerome, uh, next Wednesday. Yeah, sounds good, see you then. All right, thanks uh, for joining here on uh, line uh, appreciate it on twitch here i just started really just to stream here on twitch um i've had an account for a while but uh fairly s uh, uh, uh scheduled streams wednesday evenings uh and um just a general q a about uh, ham radio electronics so uh, feel free to check that out uh, i've been streaming mostly on youtube but uh 
using uh, restream.io to uh, to use uh, stream onto Twitch. So uh, thanks, yeah, Adam Fighter, for uh, for joining, and uh, hopefully we'll um, see you in the future. Have a good night.